the ways I've kind of done it is try to be more organized so that at the end, when you're completely fatigued after making 450 decisions throughout the renovation, you still have that clarity of mind to make sure the quality of work is maintained up until the end. You're listening to the She Renovates podcast. You're listening to She Renovates, the podcast for women who want to renovate to create an income and a life they love. So hello, everyone. So in today's episode, I have got another renovating queen, little pocket rocket, Odette. And um, Odette has been in our Wonder Woman program and she is taking a break at the moment. And I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But there's a few things that I want you to get out of today. So in the last uh, few months, firstly, Odette has been um, working on renovations for a client. And um, in that, I think we've both had a lot of learnings about the distinctions between doing your own reno and doing one from, for someone else. And it's something that if that's a line you're planning to go down, uh, I think we can shed some light on some of the things that you need to think about. The second thing is Odette is um, finishing a degree. Um, she decided after her first reno to go back and uh, complete her degree. And I think what I want what I want you to see is that life is so much easier if you have the uh, capacity to be able to get a decent loan. And we'll go into that. And that's really what Odette's working at. Yep. And, yeah, and the third one is just to really talk about those projects and, you know, we all love a good before and after. So we'll be including some before and afters in the um, show notes. So welcome, Odette. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. And um, do you want, firstly, do you want to just um, talk a little bit about who you are and, and your background and, and why you really came to renovating? So I think I met Bernadette in 2008, um, oh, 18, sorry, I beg your pardon. And um, basically I was working in corporate Australia and I was looking for an avenue to be more creative. I definitely was burnt out by corporate Australia, um, logging, boxing, de- boxing day, like lots of late hours and that sort of stuff. So I was just looking for a refreshing change um, and then I found the School of Renovating. Um, so basically, um, yeah, did all the courses and the training, which was back then in person pre COVID. Um, and I think the real passion of this comes from the fact that when I was a teen, like my whole week revolved around all the renovation shows. And I was like, I don't want to wait to like win a chance on those shows. I want to do it. So I think I was just like looking for any avenue to do it. Awesome. And so, um, and so since you've been with us, you've done three projects. Yeah. You, yeah, you initially did a project with two other Wonder Women and then you made the decision to go back to uni. Correct. And I think the primary reasoning for that decision is um, I realised after the fen- first renovation this is what I wanted to do. So I needed to get my ducks in order to be able to lay the right foundations to be able to do renovations for a long time. My borrowing capacity at the time wasn't as robust as what it could have been. And I knew having a degree behind my um, behind myself is what could push me to get those bigger numbers in terms of borrowing capacity. Um, So, yeah, it was highly motivated by renovation. Of course, I always wanted to complete it at some point. Um, But I think I was able to attain the opportunities I wanted without it in the corporate space. But it definitely impacted me in the way of renovations. Yeah. And so and so um what's the degree that you are completing? So I'm a I'm a bit of an oddball. I I think my I straddle two worlds and that is I'm definitely creative. Um but I also love the nuts and bolts of operations and IT operations. So sort of the mechanics and um how beautiful it can be when it flows so well. And there's elements of that in the renovation project project as well but what renovation gives me is like that level of creativity working with colors and lighting and spaces um so yeah 
I did choose to do IT, but I also chose to do IT aside from the fact that um, it would boost my borrowing power. Um, it's one of the spaces I've seen in corporate Australia where older women in their 50s and 60s are still maintaining high positions of leadership um, and being acknowledged as um, leading in their fields of industry. So I think for me it was borrowing capacity, but also I've seen women succeed in IT. Um, so, you know, project management. So, you know, Bernadette's always kind of reminding us about the long-term goals. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's my, my – it's an IT degree. So I love the way that for someone your age you have so much foresight. Do you mind me asking you to share how old you are? Yeah, so I'm 31. I was 31 in January. Um, I don't feel 31. I actually feel older. Um, and I think that's because, uh, yeah, I've just always grown around, grown up around like older people. Um, and I, I just, I find it a lot more interesting and I, they meet my level um, of conversation and ideas. Um, yeah, so I'm 31. Wow, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just love how strategic you are. And I think that that is the measure of a good someone who's really got the um the capacity to be really financially successful with renovating and property is being really strategic and so you're getting all your ducks in a row even though you've done three renos and you could um you could be pulling together joint ventures and and doing yeah. renos without going back to it but you're putting that um base in place and the other thing um i think is is good is the fact that you do get excited about the whole process and the systems um, in both fields. So, um, yeah, so I think that, uh, yeah, I remember when you were having the struggle um, deciding whether whether to do it or not. And it's also like unfinished business. Like yeah. um, there's a lot of, um, yeah. I guess, merit in finishing what you start. Absolutely. And if you've started a degree and you have the... Um, tenacity to go back and and finish it um even when you don't really feel like doing it that that's that's a really it's a measure of your level level of character and I think that's a it's a good thing so Thank you, yeah so um so then um what happened is I had an investor get in touch with me and say will you renovate my property and um Personally, I was really not, didn't have the capacity to do it, but I suggested to Odette that maybe she do it and I would mentor her through it. She hadn't had such a great run with her first project, so I wanted to make sure that she um, had a win or had lots of wins. And so, um, and so that's how we went about it. Now, let's talk about the different distinctions um, between so what's the, what are the good things about renovating for a client? Um, I think what you get to do is, of course, refresh a space, which is always so enjoyable. As you mentioned, we love a before and after. But also, I think within the community of the School of Renovating, we're so about sharing knowledge, sharing, you know, wins that we've had in terms of finding good trainees or good suppliers. And what we're doing um, by invest like um investing our time with investors um who want to renovate um and don't have the capacity to do so is sharing this knowledge so i guess it's fun to see them sort of go through the same process that we did earlier on which is come into the space of renovating and be stepped through it and you know i think bernadette shares her knowledge so that we don't make mistakes the way that she has in the past and that's exactly what i like to do with my clients is hold their hands um, so, th again, that they're safe within the first sort of steps in the renovation space. Yeah. And so it, we should mention that the client was was an absolute honey. She yeah, was dream client. a dream, dream client and really grateful for the, you know, for the fact that we were so focused on the outcome of her um, yeah. of her project and making sure that money was spent wisely. Well, did you find anything challenging about that? Like about, about working that with the client? Shift? Yeah. Um, this particular client was overseas and she had a, a very 
investor perspective on it, which was kind of what can we do to maximize the value of this property and get it back onto the market? So um, I think the adjustment I had to make in my mind is when I was excited to discuss, you know, tile options um, or certain finishes, she wasn't always as enthusiastic. I don't think all clients will be like that. I think there will be some clients that have um, want to put a lot, like a lot more of their personal touches into it, but she felt no need to get involved in the design process, which was great for me, but actually unexpected. Um, so sometimes I felt like, you know, um, I wanted to be like, you know, what do you think? Like what, what sort of tile do you want to use? But I think that was the one thing I was surprised by, but no real struggles with her. I think she was so accommodating in, in so many aspects, budget and time and communication. So. Absolutely. I, so I have had a few students who, who have a few other students who've renovated for clients and have been quite frustrated, not in a mentoring capacity, but have been quite frustrated because their client had ideas about what they wanted to do. And those ideas were not in the best interest of the project. Yeah. So they were finding that their client wanted to spend money that wasn't going to have a return. And yep. so there was a bit of a tussle. So while, yes, it's it's a bit disappointing if if your, your client's not as excited as you are about the tiles, um, it's definitely a plus because she certainly leaves you to do what you're good at. And um, so that's the, that's, you know, I think the best type of arrangement in that scenario. I agreed. I think I got, I got the best, yeah, the best deal possible, but um, it was, that was what was unusual, but honestly, no real struggles. Yeah. The other thing that I noticed, cause this was a first for me too, is that you have that added level of communication that you need to be aware of. Yeah. And I have to say, I am, and I'm sure you are too, I quite, I value the, the ability to be able to make a decision and just go for it. Yeah. And so you're needing to be um, ready um, or, or sort of have planned ahead so you've been able to communicate and, and include her in these decisions before yeah. you actually charge ahead. I agree. Yeah, I think that that was one of the complexities that I had to like come to grips with. But the thing is, I took it as, I mean, if you work in a joint venture, your level of communication has to be clear and consistent. And I just thought it, about it in that way that this particular individual, like a joint venture is just sitting overseas and it's about getting her the information as if she was exactly part of the project, like a joint, joint venture partner would be. Um, it also pushes you to be prepared so you know rather than some some of the times when we are renovating a joint run just standing around and just sort of chatting it through being a lot more concise in, with what you've got in front of you to present to the client so um that pushed me to kind of like I don't know being more organized um yeah. but also as I mentioned communicate knowing that she is a part of this project However, as you mentioned, it does slow down the process. I think our kitchen was pushed out by at least 10 days because she kind of wanted to go through the quotes, had a lot of questions, wasn't sure about the different suppliers, whereas we would have had that kitchen in straight away, just made a decision on the same day. So mm -hmm. that you can't really worry about because it is the timeline is set by the client. So if they're going to take longer in the communication or decision-making process, it, it, it's it's their choice to do that, you know. Yeah. The other, um, the other place where it's, um, it can catch you up is paying trades, being um, yeah. sort of making sure she's prepared for when they're coming in. Would you agree? Yeah. How did you manage and, that? Yeah, Bernadette came up with a good scheme, which was to make sure that um, – we 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 renovated for this client twice. Um, the first one was a longer renovation. This the second one was, was short and sweet. So with the payment cycles, we said to the client, could we send you invoices every Monday and you have them paid for the week? Um, when it was a quicker cycle in the second renovation, it was Mondays and Thursdays. I think Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and that expectation was set with the tradies. So I had a... Um, 
a rubbish collection service that came through and I said, you know, you need to get me your invoice by Monday. If not, you're not going to be paid till the next Monday. I set the precedent. The person who's paying for this is in Hong Kong. They need to, you know, get all of their things sorted. So you've got to help me out and get me the invoices. If they didn't get it through, they knew what the circumstances were. Of course, you get a little bit of pushback. Um, but, you know, I think they don't come at you too hard if you say, I'm not the one paying the invoices, you know. So mm. it's just about kind of um, setting the scene for the client um, and the tradies around those invoices and sticking to it. Absolutely. And there's something else that um, we we probably need to flag um, and um, it it what it wasn't an issue for this project because you were under our umbrella, but someone going out to renovate um, independently, um, getting the um, the insurance to cover their work can be very challenging, yeah. and that's something that you need to um, make sure that you you really do make, need to make sure that you have you know, have yourself adequately protected and make sure that all the right insurance is in place. And we did actually have the opportunity to test that, didn't we, Odette? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about that situation? So is this in regards to the... Um, flooding? The, the what, sorry? The flooding. Yeah, exactly. So what happened is um, there was the torrential rains in... Um, Sydney on our second renovation, which was in Arncliffe. Um, but aside from the flooding that was there um, on the balcony, we also had at the same time a leak internally where a plumber hadn't secured um, a tap underneath the sink properly. It had trickled down into the floorboards of the apartment and also down the stairs into other apartments. Um, so there was a fair bit of um, damage well, to the internal carpet and also the, the apartment underneath us. So that's a perfect example of what can go wrong. We'd used that plumber before. I trusted that plumber. Um, I think they were using a junior member of the team um, and that's where they went wrong. But there was multiple points, as I said, flooding from natural weather and also internally that there could have been some real issues. Mm. And so something that we did was when before we started the um, project is we uh, made sure that the um, the owner's public liability insurance was in place through the renovation. And so as a result, she was able to claim the replacement of the carpet in the bedroom and the, um, the floorboards in the kitchen because they all popped up and any damage to the uh, neighbours beneath. It actually um, leaked into their, their cabinets. Now, you know, like it's just, a, it's a really fine detail that if you haven't, you're not covered off on that, it can really bring the whole thing unstuck. So dotting your I's and crossing your T's is really important from a legal and a liability point of view. And, um, and so, you know, as a result, really the flood was a bonus because it actually paid for part of the renovation, which was, yeah, yeah great. And the flip side of that is, like, the, you can say, yes, the plumber should be paying for it, and he probably will, but you don't want to be the person that's taking him to court. You want the insurance company to be um, dealing with that. So make sure that you're getting really good advice before you move into this area of work. And it, it's also about the fact that the investor is entering into the contract with these supply, with these contractors, exactly. with the tradies, with the suppliers. They're paying the invoice. You are a middleman, but essentially yeah. the agreement is between the yes. client that you've got and the tradies. Yes. Um, so it, yeah. it's about making that clear from the start as well. Exactly. So um, that's um, a little bit of gold that I'm hoping that anyone that's thinking about going down this path is taking on. Now, let's actually talk about the Renaults, Odette. So yep. the first one was in Lane Cove. So do you yep. want to talk through that project? So both buildings were older blocks. Um, I think they had usually 12, um, 12 apartments in each block. Um, the 
first one lane cove didn't have good bones which means that we always look at renovating a structural component of the apartment in this case we chose to take down a wall which was dividing the living room and the kitchen making it much more open plan the other really odd thing about this particular apartment is that with all the apartments in the block all of the kitchen was pushed to one end of a gallery kitchen which was something like five meters long so long kitchen everything was crammed up the end and you had this space which I think the original design kind of laid out for um, like a small kitchen table um, or a dining table or breakfast table. It really didn't work like that. So we had to spend some money on getting um, that wall taken out and structurally reinforced and signed off, which was definitely worth it. It brought a lot more light in and completely changed the space. I felt more warm, more homely, I think for sure. Um, and up, definitely up to date. Um, I think the other things we sort of did was, um, of course, renovate the bathroom, which ha had leaks um, through the walls, etc. And then touch up the bedrooms, which didn't need a lot of work. Um, we left the balcony till last because that was a, a choice around budget. Um, so we just did some paint work there to touch up that balcony. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good space. It was definitely an older layout, which kind of had long hallways and that sort of stuff. So it was bringing that up to date. Um, yeah, I, I really love what we end up doing. Yeah, excellent. And did you ever get a completion valuation? Um, I don't think we did in the end, but I think when we got the initial valuation about whether it was worth taking out the wall or not, um, the agent that we went through said that it was a difference of 50k to the sale price okay um so yeah okay. i think that that's, that's the sort different. of value we did end up adding yeah yeah and um so um how did you protect us from um complaints from the neighbors about us causing damage to their home in the process I think I, I have a bit of a, a knack for this anyway. So my mom calls me Susie Cream Cheese. Um, I'm always <laughs> running around um, talking to people and, you know, making friends. But I think just um, there was absolutely one neighbor that was just not on our side. But just going around introducing myself, there was an older gentleman there that loved a good chat when he was taking out the garbage and a lovely neighbor next door who invited me over for coffee lots of times. So I think when you just kind of, make yourself known and humanize yourself by being friendly and talking through, Hey, look, this is what we're doing. Come in, have a look, you know, cause it's such a, it's a space they're living in too, not necessarily the same block, but the neighbor next door, it was her apartment mirrored. So we gave her ideas of, you know, anything she, she might want to take on in the future. Um, then they sort of, although there is noise that they're putting up with, they're a lot more sort of accepting of the process. Um, they all had my numbers so they could call me yeah. anytime. I never got a call, even from the very difficult neighbor upstairs. So yeah. really just being friendly and just humanizing the process. Like, yes, you are going to get woken up at seven, but it's only for these four days. You know, if you've got something on, let me know. We can work with it. Yeah. And did you have to get any dilapidation reports? Yes, we did. For the um, for pulling out the wall, Bernadette was awesome in guiding me through that. Um, the dilapidation reports had to come from three surrounding apartments that would be affected by our structure of the of the apartment um, if we were to pull out that wall. Yeah. And so that was a bit of a process. But Yeah. Do you want to walk us through that process just quickly? Yeah. So we have, um, but it has a uh, structural engineer that she's used before. Um, when the request came through from Strata that the dilapidation reports had to come through before the wall could be pulled down or approved to be pulled down, we went back to him with all the different criteria. Um, one of the mistakes I made is I assumed that he would need to do a dilapidation report for our apartment itself, in addition to the apartment surrounding us. Um, and this is a good lesson I learned, which is to really read through the fine sort of details of the conversations you're having, because that was not necessary. Um, and those reports are costly, each one. So, um, you know, just, you know, again, as Bernadette said, dotting your I's and crossing your T's, this will save you money. Um, it would take me 10 minutes extra to read it, um, but I that was one of the things I learned. He came through, took photos, 
um, for each of the apartments um, and then submitted a report to Strata. That, of course, meant that we had to get the permission from each of those tenants or residents in those different apartments to be at home, um, take the photos. And that meant one of the um, neighbours had to pop home from work and take an hour and a half off work. Um, so this is, again, why you have to kind of make yourself known to the neighbours because you're going to need them in some cases, hopefully not too often. Yeah, but I, and look, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. I, something that I always do is put my, particularly before demolition day, put my phone number in the lift and a lot of people say to me, you know, you shouldn't be doing that because people will ring you and, you know, abuse you. But they don't. Like if you are, if you're communicating, they really appreciate it. And I did get calls and they would say, I know that you can't do anything about it and I really appreciate that you gave us your contact details. You know, when do you think it'll be stopping? That's, you know, that's yeah. as bad as it got. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's definitely a, um, a, you know, Susie Cream Cheese definitely it has a role to play. Um, yeah. Now I let's... Think the sorry. other thing, sorry to cut you off, Benedict, is when you do this process well, they will help you in ways you don't expect them too so I had a neighbor say I know your bathroom is being renovated all this week just come and use mine I'm at home the whole whole week like pop in she was working from home so that really goes a long way you know absolutely absolutely uh, so another way that we added value was by um because our client did want to put her property on the market but not straight away because she was managing the the tax implications um, so what we did was connect her with a, a an agent who manages corporate um, rentals so that she was more likely to get a shorter term uh, client and someone who was going to look after her newly renovated properties. So there's lots of things that you can add value to that aren't directly associated with the reno. Yep. Yeah. I think it's about thinking what is it exactly that would be perfect for scenario because there is actually options for that in all the various scenarios. Exactly, yeah. So then we whipped over to Arncliffe. Now, Arncliffe uh, was a property that she did want to sell. So do you want to talk through that um, process, starting with the valuations? So we um, got the... Um, real estate agent who was currently leasing out that apartment, it had become vacant to walk us through um, and give us a valuation as it was, but also to talk about the market um, and the area, what their preferences were, what they like to see in terms of finishes, the way they live, that sort of thing. Um, he walked through, that gave us an idea. Um, he did offer us some trades as well um, of who they use. We end up going with our own. The evaluation really started not only with the apartment but also the surrounding spaces, which was an external storage space, um, which is very valuable um, in, you know, after COVID. Um, we end up just painting that space and leaving it blank. Um, but also, you know, we took some time around the balcony and that sort of thing as well after his advice. Yeah. And so what did you – so what was the budget on that, Renault? And, um I think it was 30, it ended up being like 35, including, yeah. um, that was including a kind of safety net. Yeah. And it came in at around 28. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So really well done. Yeah. And so what was the scope of that renovation? It wasn't like Lane Cove. The bones were a lot better there. Um, it was kind of already in a position to have just those touch-ups come in. Um, so that's what we did. We like cosmetically renovated all aspects of the apartment, kitchen, bathroom, um, new carpets and laundry. There was some cabinetry. Um, also, the lighting made a big difference. The lighting in that space was really old. Um, Bernadette has some great ideas about doing some feature lighting over the countertop as well. So it was a cosmetic update, but a huge, I think about a 20K difference, lower, lower budget than um lane cove but that's because the bones were good so it was really yeah. about just lifting the space yeah and i think probably one of the um key ways we saved money was one so firstly we we intended to spray the bathroom but mm. at the time there was a world shortage on the material that they use and yeah. so we ended up tiling over tiles which 
has a few complications, doesn't it, Odette? It does, but a lot less than you would think. Yeah, yeah. And so um, one of the main complications is getting the taps to work. And one of the negatives with um, tiling over tiles is the fact that you can't switch over to uh, mixer taps. So one of the, mm. you know, one of the advantages is that you don't, the um, waterproof membrane doesn't get disturbed. Now, if you want to switch over to mixer taps, you need to cut into the wall to put that mixing piece into the wall, the barrels into the wall. And so you can't do that. So you have to stick with the hot and cold, which is fine because there's some really nice designs, but um, sometimes the spindle's not long enough um, in order to accommodate the extra thickness. So it, it takes a bit of juggling to get it to work, but it did work and it worked really well. Yeah, and that was and really the only hiccup. It was, yeah. yeah, the rest of it went quite well. So with the kitchen, what? how how did you save money in the kitchen? Bernadette um, had the great idea of just getting new doors um, for the cabinetry rather than pulling everything out and putting completely new cabinetry in. Because it had good bones, the, the layout of the cabinetry was pretty decent. It just needed, um, you know, it was dated and it was also discolored. So it needed just a new finish on it. You find, I, I found it difficult to get suppliers who will only supply a cabinet, cabinet door and not the full sort of frame of it. But we did find one and it, that saved so much money. Yeah. It took a little bit longer to get in, but, you know, because they had to come and cut, cut the doors to size, et cetera. But it did exactly what it needed to do, update the space and do so on like, you know, a beer budget rather than a champagne budget, but That's as Bernadette right. says. I've heard I've heard a new expression now, Prosecco on a champagne budget. Much lovely. Better. I yeah. don't even like beer. So Me too. <laughs> yeah. But I think the key thing um, that you have to think about when you're preparing something to sell is that um, is the impact when someone steps in the door. Because you know they say first impressions are uh, really important and that's why that kitchen area needed to absolutely sing and in actual fact we bought a light fitting it didn't do it so we had to buy yep. another one and sometimes you know like we can all be you know uh, it's important not to let your um uh i guess need to stick to the budget derail the project so you know we could have for, well, we've already bought a light and I'm not going to waste the money. But um, in reality, that would have been a mistake because that light fitting, and you'll see an image in the show notes, really lifted the area and added the wow that we needed. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. It's always about taking a step back and look, when you're looking at those decisions, especially how busy renovations are, it's so easy to get into a tunnel vision where you're just like, you know, using the same formulas over and over again. But you know that's why um it's great when we renovate as teams is we have that room to step back and just you know discuss between ourselves really is this going to work yeah. um and the client thankfully was um on board she understood that it was going to make a massive impact um yeah. and it, again it's so case by case it's just about I think sometimes it's easy to get fatigued at the end of a renovation. It's about making sure you honour the quality of your work from start to finish because oh, that's look, really yeah, going to show in the in the sale price. I Sorry for interrupting. I so agree with that. And the other thing is I think there is massive value in having a brains trust. And I don't think that necessarily needs to be, um, you know, it doesn't mean you have to do all your projects in joint ventures, but just having... Um, people that are invested in your success that you can call in. And, like, I've been renovating for 30 years. I still do this because sometimes towards the end of a renovation you lose your perspective, which mm -hmm. is, I think, a lot. it's a lot about fatigue. And sometimes you need someone who is willing to say to you, no, that looks crap. You know, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And that because if you go to your family and friends, they'll say, they'll say everything's lovely. Yeah. So, um, having a and that's where I think having that community is um, is really really important. What would you say have been your three uh, 
top learnings from doing renovations with clients or with a client? With clients, um, definitely to reiterate the point we've just made, which is you are working in a different time frame when you're working with clients. You know, you can buy yourself time when you're working for yourself. If you need that extra week before putting it on the market, you can have it. Whereas with clients, if you're kind of setting yourself or have discussed a date, you've really got to meet that date. So, you know, you are under the pump a little bit more. And, and as we've just discussed, the fatigue definitely comes in. So it's about trying to, the, the ways I've kind of done it is try to be more organized so that at the end, when you're completely fatigued after making 450 decisions throughout the renovation, you still have that clarity of mind to make sure the quality of work is maintained up until the end, whether it be getting in a good clean or the last minute finishes in this case for the laundry, um, just making sure that you, um, yeah, have the, have that commitment to the quality. So that's the first one. Um, the second thing would definitely be, I think sometimes when we're in a joint venture, we kind of do the planning. Well, this is a personal scenario, but we do the planning up until 80% and kind of think, okay, well, we'll do the rest of the planning as we go. I think it pays off more to definitely sit down, even if it means an extra day at home in the office rather than on site planning, planning, planning. Take it down all the way to what skirting boards you want, what photo, what photographer you're going to get in. Because as I mentioned, at the end, things get hazy, you know, so and it's a rush. And so having your your earlier self make all those decisions for you, you're just giving yourself that safety net. Where, where you know things are going to go smoothly. So, yeah, just definitely plan, plan, plan. Even if you think you're being excessive, you're really never going to regret it. So just take that planning as far as you can. You know, look and, look and try and be intuitive when you're seeing the photos in line of what you want to replicate, every detail that needs to go in that space. Um, and I think the other thing I learned was I do this thing where I kind of try to tell the tradies, okay, this is what you've got to do only. Don't worry about this or don't worry about that. This is what you've got to do. Actually, they do need to know kind of the background of what's yeah. going on with the plumber, if they're an electrician, what's going on with the tiler, etc. That might seem silly, but, you know, I made a few mistakes where I made assumptions that they were kind of on the same page as me because I was like, here's your list, off you go. Whereas I needed to be like, hey, by the way, the tailor's coming tomorrow. He's going to do X, Y, and Z. How does that impact you? Or, hey, did you know I'm planning to do this feature in this section? How does that impact you? Most of the time you'll get a no, but on three occasions across these two no renovations, I wasn't on the same page as, page as my trading because I was only giving them information on what I thought was a need-to-know basis, which was incorrect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I couldn't put, have put that better myself, Odette. Thank you. And so what's next for you? So I am very excited because I got a lovely new job. Um, and the job is in um, the IT space of architecture software, which is phenomenal. So it's the best of both worlds. Um, and I'm very excited about that. Um, so that will definitely, I've got six more months of my degree. So as we do, we take on what we can and I've got to straddle both those things for six months. It's only six months. I can absolutely do it. And then go back to, you know, um, my mortgage broker and say, what can I borrow with the degree and the good job and, and see what I can do in terms of joint ventures. Awesome. Well, listen, Odette, you deserve everything that comes your way because you're an absolute delight and you are so committed to your goals. I'm really excited for you. Thank you, Bernadette. I appreciate it. With your guidance, it's it's easy to, to get Aww. on top of these things. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thanks for that. If you want to meet up with a group of savvy renovating, I shouldn't say it's all women because it's not, but savvy renovators, I'll say, come over and join She Renovates. It's completely it's free Facebook group and it is growing at the rate of knots. We hit a thousand members just recently and now it seems to have picked up momentum. And so they are all savvy renovating women and men that are working their little hearts out to live a better life through renovating. Join if you're not already a member 
and then ask, comment and do whatever you would like to do in order to further your renovation journey. And that's it for me today. So I'll see you next week. This is the She Renovates podcast. To discover how to harness the power of renovating, check out theschoolofrenovating.com.